Welcome to the When We Cry. <laughs> nope. We Welcome to the When We Cry Book Club Woo! podcast. I swear to God, everybody, this is a tongue twister every single time. I'll never get it right. <laughs> My claim to fame. We are going to be discussing Umineko's fifth episode. This is the second part of our episode discussion. I am your host, Lorenzo, joined by. Joined by your great equalizer, Death. Also, your friendly neighborhood mushroom. And uh, I guess the guest star Sayome. Yay, guest Sayome! Star. <laughs> <laughs> ah, queen, lover. I sneak myself back in here. <laughs> yes, we appreciate it. Like uh, a little bit like somebody we know who we will talk about shortly. But um, how have you all been? Ah, nice. Well, very good. How has everyone else been? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, uh, I have one thing to say. I re- reread House of Leaves, and everybody who read House of Leaves and also read Umin Echo, I see you. I don't know. Fight me. Uh, not fight me. Uh, talk to me on Discord if you have my Discord. I know who you are. So <laughs> That's so funny. I was just talking to a friend about that, like, last week, and he was just showing me how, like, the printing of the book is, like, upside down, yeah. sideways, told from five different points of view, third-hand information. I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> it's, it's Umin Echo. Read House of Leaves. It's a visual novel in real life, it's, huh? It's <laughs> literally a visual novel in real life. I don't even know how to explain it. Like, House of Leaf is good. But uh, how about you, Sayomi? What's up? I mean, not much, but it's been going. Awesome. Well, we love it when things are going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, do you have anything to share, anybody? Yes. Anything interesting? Cool? Yes. Yeah, go for it. So last episode, I was sucking the enormous dick of Fire what? Emblem Three Hopes. <laughs> Today, I, after... 20 hours of playing the actual game. Uh, I'm still playing it. Ah, it has quite the major problems, like everywhere you look. All I know about Fire Emblem Three Hopes is that my friend says, uh, my friend says all of the dads in the game looks fugly, and I was like, "What do you mean by fugly? Like funny and ugly?" She's like, "No, it looks fucking ugly." <laughs> no, no, no. I, I really like every little addition they do. Pretty much everything regarding the story and characters is really fine, really cool. The problem is with the game itself, because it has some stupid things. Like, I really like Hyrule Warriors, because if in case you've never played a Warriors game, you play through the maps, and every map has a couple of objectives, and every time you clear an objective, the game does a bookmark save for you. So if you die, you can restart from the previously cleared objective, so that you don't have to start the map from the beginning. But in three hopes now, if you die at the end, you gotta, you know, those 20 minutes of progress you did, and now you gotta do everything from the beginning. Amazing. Thank you very much, Koei Tecmo. I love your design decisions. <laughs> and there's just a lot of things like this throughout the game, and I'm like, why? Why? <laughs> Isn't that just the a-, a pressing simulator? Yes, but it's an A pressing simulator that gives you a lot of funny hormones that make you feel good when you kill 20 people with one hit funny hormones <laughs> when oh. you kill 20 people yes anyway so love that for you what about you mushroom have you played three hopes no uh i haven't played three hopes yet because unlike everybody else despite of the fact that i talk big and i hate three houses i still haven't not successfully finished three houses yet <laughs> and honestly the only route i really want to play is black eagles which i can't because i don't play but i don't like three houses yet <laughs> so you know i'm just i love buying um i do have a really good friend who has the game and so she's gonna stream half of it to me Half of it, so like two and a half routes, uh, one and a half routes. Uh, yes, I can't, I mean, you know, I can't really watch the parts that are spoilery. So, I mean, uh, yeah, besides that, um, yes, I've been Genjining. Genjining is good. Uh, Genjining. Gen- yes. Um, Sounds like a slur. <laughs> Genshin. 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 Those damn Are you talking Genshin. about? Wait, you're talking about Genshin, right? <laughs> yes, Genshin Impact. Yes. Yeah. As in the impact. Wait, I must ask. Have you guys heard about the Persona Five embezzling scheme? No. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry to like interrupt. So No, this is, sounds good. I'm excited. <laughs> for you all who are out of the loop, uh last week or I guess on Friday. This came out on Friday. Um there was a 
Akechi X, whatever the main character's uh, like Akira given or, name is. Or if Akira. you were bad, you, you what is this the other name that they gave him? Um, well, I named him Fisty Baby Slut. So the Akechi <laughs> Fisty Baby Slut Yaoi Persona Five fanzine. There was one of those out there. It made like. 80k wow they really got that bankroll in like profits or some shit like that or like you know just yeah they got the bank and the person who is handling the funds ran away with almost 30k and spent it all on genshin and (gasps) oh i heard it actually yeah (laughs) yes so now you know um, oh, what the fuck is <laughs> up, bro? So that's my current stake in Genshin Impact. Haven't played, but I do know that. Um, my yeah. Did they at least get the character they wanted? Yeah, I wish. I I hope they at least pulled. Uh, like, they probably get them like C seven them or whatever. Yeah, I hope they. I why would they spend it all on what? That's so ridiculous. I don't know. That is the funniest uh, shit possible. You know, I would too. I think. Okay, Warren. So what have you been doing? Um, well, it is Pride Weekend. Happy Pride Weekend, everybody. Yeah, imagine being gay. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. I don't have to imagine. I know, right? Uh, disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I can live it. True. <laughs> but um, I've been wilding out. Actually, not really. Oh. I like went <laughs> to De Club on Friday. I went freaking crazy, got spanked a little bit. Oh. And then we watched this creepy dude like feel up a bunch of people make out with what? them and he was left alone in left alone in the end it was a riveting experience oh. we were just like what the fuck does that even mean <laughs> he was okay so like we go to this we go to this bar right i'm like trying to like get undrunk and um <laughs> there's this dude at the corner of this bar and he's feeling this guy up like <laughs> sticking his hand in his crack <laughs> like you know saving 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 some from later for later i don't know <laughs> and then um the guy who was feeling up leaves with his boyfriend <laughs> and we're like, Oh shit. And then somebody else comes in. I don't know who he's with. Maybe like a girlfriend, wife, friend, whatever. The guy's doing the same thing, feeling up his crack, <laughs> making out with him, sticking his hands down his pants. They're both making out with each other. Like for like three solid minutes in like three separate instances throughout the night. And then this guy, <laughs> He leaves with his girlfriend, friend, wife. I don't know. <laughs> and this creepy guy is like just back at it, just like leering across the bar with his serial killer eyes. And we're like, uh oh, I think you can hear us talking about him. So, and then we leave. Uh, happy Pride. <laughs> That's that's about it. That's my pride I, experience. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to know that we we can even cancel the gays. I, I I really don't know. Like my friend and I, we were just like l- looking at it, and she's like, "That would be awful. I don't want to be. Like, <laughs> I would not want to be in this position." But it was so much fun to like, you know, just people watch and just like <laughs> sprinkle in our own theories about what's going on in this guy's life. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> How many bodies he has in his trunk, you know? Like, he looked like he was the kind. Oh. Like, he 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 ate people. <laughs> I'm sure. He he was on Dahmer mode. I mean, he did eat that one person's lips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. But, uh, yeah, that was that was my weekend so far. <laughs> Quite the eventful weekend. Simon, so, you said you didn't have anything? I mean, not much. Just vibing. Good. Love that. Okay, then let's get... Into Mineko, I have exactly uh, 83 minutes of life right now. So. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Before we jump in, everybody play uh, Isomnium Files Nirvana Initiative. Please and thank you. Okay, let's go. Uh... Oh, okay. Actually, I wanted to say something. <laughs> 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 I, but, it, but it's going to be worth it. Because what I want to say is, while I was editing last episode, I realized last episode actually had... The, I think the best plot summary ever because we were laughing pretty much at everything you said, Lorenzo. So I wanted to say good job. Oh, oh, babe. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll do my best to continue being a clown. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Clussy game strong. Let's go. Okay. So uh, right when we left off, we were in the thick of Nats- the Natsuhi did it theory and Battler jumping back into the game while also realizing the red truth can bleed into the real world TM with serious consequences. So um, right now um, the board game is being set up for the fifth game. And uh, right now Natsuhi's scheming with the servants to like keep up the whole Kinzo still alive situation. Mm-hmm. We're now back pre-October 19, uh, October 5th, 
4th, 4th through 6th, 1986. <laughs> uh, Jessica learns that Battler is going to show up to the family conference while Krauss continues to mansplain to Natsuhi <laughs> about how great his NFT venture will be for the family. <laughs> and Natsuhi he's speaking with Kinzo, quote unquote, and Beatrice in the study, and they convince her that with a little bit of magic that they might actually be able to pull through with uh, Krauss's schemes and save the family. Um, all they have to do is keep up the Kinzo illusion and um, not so he provides a strategy in which Kinzo doesn't leave his room this year, in essence setting up a magical barricade with Beatrice's help. Uh, all the meanwhile, meta battlers piecing together the truth behind who's actually present in this scene. In this scene, it's Natsuhi, Be- uh, Beatrice, and Kinzo. And right when he's about to say, like, okay, the true number of people is, Beto feels personally attacked. Like, the, you know that one Fairly Odd Parents scene where Trixie rips up that photo of her best friend <laughs> and she feels it, like, yeah. you know, 10 miles away? Mm-hmm. That's kind of what this, this uh, husk of a Beto is feeling. But Battler assures her that Beatrice can still exist with some blue truth, not that he likes her or anything, but he'll make sure that he'll understand her side of the story this time around. <laughs> Gay as hell, am I right? Happy Pride. <laughs> I'm back on the free game board. <laughs> Everybody's prepping for this conference. Uh, the servants are discussing the game plan on keeping Kinzo alive, you know. Not actually alive, but like the illusion of him. And the siblings are talking about how Keynes is actually probably dead and how Krauss is using him as a puppet to keep everybody's suspicions at bay. And then the siblings just, everybody but Krauss, are discussing how to extort Krauss. Um, <laughs> they're also convincing Rosa to participate, in which she thinks about it by neglecting Maria again. Queen, <laughs> not that. Uh, not so he's brooding in her room pre-conference. Uh, she's anxious about the conference, and she receives a call from a mystery man claiming to be her child from 19 years ago somehow. Like, which is weird because Jessica's her only child. Jessica's, I think, 17, 18? Uh, um, 17, I think. They just want to call Natsuhi mommy. <laughs> yes, I know. Some, some dude's like, mommy milky. <laughs> and she's like, <gasps> and she, she slams the phone and she's like, what the fuck? But she knows something about this person, freaks the fuck out, slams the phone back down. Uh, Burn and Lambda finish up a game of Magic the Gathering. They say, like, you know, <laughs> upkeep, untap, draw. <laughs> and they say that the game board's been set up for the fifth game. We fast forward to the beginning of October 4th, 1986, and everybody's arriving on the islands yet again. This time, Natsuhi and the servants are discussing their game plan in front of the camera. <laughs> Beatrice <laughs> assures her that as long as the study remains closed, the barrier slash illusion will remain unbroken. And um, she introduces her demon entourage, Ronove and Gap, who will help with keeping the illusion alive. We go back to the metaverse where Burn and Lambda product battler saying that there's a point to going through this fourth day, like first day setup, as there's a riddle that can be solved given the info at this point, and presumably the epitaph, maybe something else, but they don't actually say what it is. But I really like this scene because I think Ryugishi wrote this mostly bec- to tell people, hey, if you're just waiting around for the story to give you the answers, here's my little two paragraphs of hey, you should try to solve the story. It's worth it. Give it a try. Right, exactly. But then we fast forward to Maria looking for her rose in the garden and she's greeted by a mystery person. Uh, Genji alerts Natsuhi of this person in which she's afraid it's the guy who was like, mommy milky over the phone (laughs) the other day. But instead, it's... (gasps) Fruto Erica! Cue that one, her theme here at this point in the recording. (laughs) Exactly. The great detective knows. Or is it Dipujir? It's a a great detective knows. It's. No, you should just play the Sasamonga remix (laughs) on the bottom. (laughs) 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 But, um, Battler's like, who the fuck is this? And <laughs> it's Burns OC do not steal, clearly. So true. <laughs> Literally. It's a it's apparently a castaway who happens to who happened to land on the island. She's literally a self-insert. She almost looks like Burn herself. And uh Burn Burn uses the red truth to um establish Erica's standing in the game as the detective of the story and solely exists to pick apart the mystery from the human's point of view. Yeah. Lambda backs her up and says that everybody in the parlor is equal to the number of people on the island. So that includes all of the family members, Sans Kinzo, and all of the servants. Dun dun dun. I, I, I like this because Butler is just like, what the fuck? 
another person this is this is gonna mess everything up like we had everything reasoned out like there are no more than this amount of people in this island and everything then Baron's like shut the fuck up man like have these two paragraphs of red and shut the fuck up <laughs> yeah and then I love how Lambda's like easy it's just whatever we decided on the amount of people plus one no big deal <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Exactly. So, any thoughts, feelings? Yes, I, I really, I really like that segment where uh, Jessica just punches Butler in the stomach, and then the narration is like, "Not so he gazed at this," and then between brackets, "charming." Yeah, it's just like, get, do you need any more indication that this story is being woven by Lady Lambda Delta herself than this? amount of slapstick humor that was just introduced into Mineko. <laughs> it feels like the story's being like toyed with. It's kind of funny. It, it is you funny. I love that. I agree. Uh-huh. Yes. Is that all the things that you're covering today, Lorenzo? Yeah, just just these two chapters because there's lots to talk about and like 30 minutes left of Des's battery that can oh. withstand the recording. <laughs> so, anybody have any non-spoiler non-spoilery thoughts? Uh, um, up to this point? No. Cool. All right. So we will shift over to the spoiler section. Um, If you haven't listened to past this or read past this, uh, don't listen unless you want the story ruined. (laughs) But um, other than that, thanks for listening with us. Sea cats, do crimes. Catch you later. See ya. Okay. Spoiler section. Whoa. Okay. Okay, now that we're in the spoilers, we can finally tell you. Okay, the reason... Fuck the poly scene. The, the, the reason this episode is going to be covering two chapters is because of the EP5 parlor incident. We need yeah. to fucking tackle fucking that. bullshit. So, in one corner of the ring, we have Sayome, who calls it absolute bullshit. Mm-hmm. In another corner of the ring, you have me, who will try to defend it. Fuck you. Where do you stand, Lorenzo and Mushroom? What's the parlor thing? The parlor scene is everybody, like, um, Nazi's gone, right? And then everybody else is in the parlor. I will tell you what I will tell you what the problem is. Okay, no, so no, no. I, I'm gonna is... wait, wait, wait. Could I, could I just describe the scene and then you can just say this is the scene and then I'm gonna say what I think you think the problem is. Or <laughs> okay, no, no, no. no. Sure. So, so, this, so the scene is this, right? Like the, we're setting the scene. It's where everybody else is in this room, and then they get Shannon and Cannon in this room, and then they start basically hounding them for like whatever the fuck, like, like relationships or something and you know and then suddenly at 12 o'clock they hear knocking what? No. right is that the scene or no am i crazy no the the okay the scene is it's as simple as literally every character in the story is present in the parlor in front of the detective oh. which includes canon and shannon separately and shannon. i mean okay that is the problem and we, we're gonna discuss this. Sayome thinks the answer is bullshit. I kind of understand the answer. So we're gonna walk you through this and oh, you'll tell us what you think. It's because they said... Because I think from... The, 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 the answer is that, like, from Erica's angle, she can't really see canon or something. Like, no, that's a that's a future yeah. mis- That's a future trick. <laughs> what? Okay. No, no, that's the answer. That's what are you talking about? No. That's the no, answer. no, 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 no. You're thinking of a dif- uh, Sayome. The what? trick is not that one. The the trick of Canon sh- being in an angle that Erika cannot see him oh, no, from is a future trick. It's okay. not this trick. Okay. okay. What's this trick? So, this trick is. So I- I'm gonna start from the beginning. Canon is only possible if Shannon and Canon are never seen together by the detective. Then we see Butler's narration that says, oh, I see this person and this person. He, and he just name drops everyone and says, to my right is George, to my left is Jeshka. So we know from when Butler arrives, that scene is being told by him. It cannot be told by his POV before he arrives because he's mm-hmm. simply not there. Oh. Then Shannon and Cannon are there. And at this point, you read it and you're like, but how is that possible? The detective cannot see Shannon and Cannon in the same person, in the same room. So... In EP8 manga, only in the manga, it is revealed that, oh no, someone told Erika that Canon was somewhere else preparing her room. So that's, so, so basically that's the trick. The scene is told by Butler's POV and not by Erika's. Even though you're aware to believe that it is Erika's POV because she's a detective. And you never get the clue that Erika was told Canon was somewhere else. Yeah. So do you understand what's going on here? 
Yeah. Do you understand the problem? I mean, it's how how it's just how Ryukishu writes. Like, I don't know how to explain it, yeah. but there's scenes in like fucking EP three where like there's just this three different perspectives written one after the other. It's not like Ryukishu actually tells you who's thinking or anything. So it goes from third person, first person, third person, and you're like, mm, thanks, Ryukishu. What was that about? Okay, but the, but the problem here is. Okay, Sayume, tell us what you what. Okay, you're you're the best one to tell us why it's wrong because yeah. you're the one who thinks it's wrong. Basically, like uh, at first we just see everyone in the pod like without uh everyone else like without Butler without Erika and like mm-hmm. while everyone is there like Kanon just basically just waltz into the room with uh Goda like giving everyone tea and everyone like there's two people who acknowledge Kanon like there's Goda and there's Maria and I don't mm-hmm. think Goda would like. If we're told that like uh, Shannon is off with like uh, helping Erica and shit. Yeah, we Kumasawa. Yeah, I just like I don't I I don't think uh, I I mean Ma- Maria would maybe be in on it because like she would be like oh yeah you're so cool. But you don't think Oda is? Yeah. And then Erica comes in. And yeah, and er- like it's it's treated like Kanon is still in the room, but like nothing has changed. It's like it's just so weird because like the way everything is set up because. Shannon comes in with like Erica at the same time and like Kanon is portrayed to still be in the room at that time or like to have not left. It's like it's like, there's no clue that Kanon has ever left or that Eric anyone has ever told Erica that like Kanon left or something. Wait, I jo- wait, I am so confused. Wait, wait, could I see the land? Could you tell me exactly which page it is on the LB archive? I just have to go read that part now. Just like I feel like I didn't think it was that weird until you ex- Oh, I see it. It's uh Chapter 7. Because the narration tells you Kanon is serving everyone. And then yeah. Erika comes in. And Goda is interacting with Kanon. And then Shannon comes in. And they're both in front of Erika. And then Butler comes in. And Butler name drops everyone. In the yeah. in the text, uh, Kumisawa and Shannon are behind Erika when she enters. So if I would insert my take, I think if we assume that Erika is supposed to be like the reader's point of view but that's the thing Lorenzo that can't that is that isn't the trick because it's canon that is supposed to be absent in the answer it's not Shannon yeah oh really okay uh, mm. uh, just unrelated I love how everybody's just saying go to serving tea because in light of pride month I'm thinking he's just like <laughs> voking in the middle of the parlor he's like oh he's serving yeah. girl I mean he actually is because like everyone wants tea on uh Erica and stuff Mm-hmm. Oh, exactly. <laughs> okay, is this some gay stuff I don't understand? <laughs> it's, it's, it is. It's, it's okay. And now you know, <laughs> serving tea, serving. It's just you know when somebody serves cunt basically, and tea as in They're just a gossiping. I don't know, gay essence. Yeah, gossiping. Mm. So now you know. <laughs> okay. Well, doesn't matter. All that matters is Erika was told that Canon was in a different room, but we only learned this in EP8 and only in the manga. So there are no clues that this scene is told from the persp- from the general perspective, not by someone's POV. So it's just like Cannon's attack on the servants from Mini P2, because there's just no detective there to see the thing. So it's just a general POV. Then Erika arrives, uh, and then Butler arrives. And when Butler arrives, we are certain that the scene is told from his POV. Yeah, and also the manga's fake. We already decided that we only we will only selectively choose to believe the manga. <laughs> Didn't Ryukishi say that like the manga is an official answer from him? No, fuck Ryukishi. He goes. No, he said that he supervised <laughs> the manga or something. I think it's like uh, at the wiki. I always say, see like at the bottom it says like uh, the manga is an official answer from me, Ryukishi 07 or something. Yeah, Ryukishi 07 also goes walks into interviews and just straight up lies. So why would I believe him? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I basically I this is the cat box of Ryukishi. If I don't look at him, then he's not real. <laughs> <laughs> True. I mean, it could just materialize. Okay, so do you understand? Do you understand what the problem is now? Yeah, no, um, I mean, Mushroomman Lorenzo. I do. I mean, there are actually a lot of very unsatisfying ways how EP4 is, CP5 is written, that specifically with the Shannon and Canon trick, because I think, like, if you were a reader who basically got to the Shannon and Canon, um, like, decision, like, Shannon, Triss, 
uh, you know, EP5 is where the game basically, tr- you know, Rukishi's trying to m- come up with more and more scenarios that it looks so unlikely they're the same person. Yeah, but it isn't really fair. That's the problem. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I mean, I don't think it makes sense in the scenario at all. Okay, so basically just like dance with Elk Suck. That's it. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do like Okay, the like two, of, two out of four of them are bad. Objectively. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, it was a bit of a hot take. Uh, but yeah. yeah, but no, I mean, unless, um, okay, if somebody in the comment section that could do a better explanation of how the scene would work, please. No, I have an explanation. I'm, I was just establishing <laughs> the groundwork. Oh my god, that's why did you just breathe so hard to tell me what it is then? So, in all games up until now, fantasy never occurs when the detective is present. It's like an unspoken room. Uh, unspoken rule, for fuck's sake. But then in EP5, Wambda faces us with a more than one stake. Fantasy never occurs when the detective is present is too broad. So now we're dealing with fantasy never occurs if we're reading from the detective's POV. So this is the rules that are changed now. In, in, the, in the question arcs, uh, if Butler was there, we just ruled the scene as mystery and there was no fantasy there. But now we need to understand that even if the detective is present, there can be fantasy because the scene can just be from someone else's POV and we'll just never know. And this seemed like a very cheap trick to me because without any kind of clue, the unspoken rule is broken and it breaks the trust between the reader and the writer. And the detective basically has clues that we do not. Erika was told that Canon was preparing a room. We are not told that. So that is kind of, that is actually just breaking Nox 8, that it is forbidden for the case to be resolved with clues that are not present. And then I wanted to compare it to two examples, one of them being Natsuki's room, in EP2, and the other one being the servant's room. So the other servant's room, uh, with the I think it's example, I want to make the story, and then the story is the text series. And in EP2, it's the text series, where I want to reflect to the text series. And the what the fuck do I want to say? I feel like sometimes I just start talking and then I lose track of what I want to say. True. Let me focus for a minute. Okay, I do have to say this. So, um, I what I do want to come back to what Des is saying about you know Minako and how the narrative is told. Um, if you think about the how the EP six is told, um, the story doesn't actually goes on. And oh, sorry. Let me. How how am I gonna organize my thoughts? So yes, so we're both dying. <laughs> Excuse me, I am going to, to try to do my best. So, you know how in EP6, um, basically the story basically ceased to be a, uh, a world where other people live in? Like, basically, like, you, like, you know, things happen and then, like, characters react or anything. It becomes literally a story that they're writing. Like, you know, like, yeah. Erica could retroactively put in, like, things. Or, like, Erica could retroactively said like, oh, I have already done this like two hours ago it's like because you wrote in the rules and so i think from that perspective it but makes... that's tp6 right yes but what i'm trying to say is like from that perspective it makes more sense that like everything erica only the things erica sees is true and like if you hear any narration then you know narration could lie but that's the thing you never you never see erica's pov in the in the answer arcs yeah never it you never see erica's pov that's that's the thing you're supposed to realize through this scene. It's that in this scene, you're not seeing the detective's POV. And you'd never see the detective's POV throughout the whole answer arcs. That's the crazy part. Hmm. Yeah, I guess so. Okay, it's so bullshit, though. <laughs> it's Okay, I'm gonna tell you why it's not... I think it's, it's fine to think it's a cheap trick. You're entitled to it. But Umineko deliberately tests the boundaries of the trust between author and reader. So it's inevitable it's going... Yeah, that in episode 8, Yokishi shits on all of us. Great great author. That's true. He, he, he shits on people who give up on solving the mystery right from the bat. He doesn't shit on people who simply... Yeah, then he reveals it in episode 7. Fucking dumbass. <laughs> Ooh. It's just inevitable. <laughs> it's... Some of the tricks are inevitably going to be deemed cheap by some fans because Umineko is about testing boundaries. 
<laughs> so oh, I'm I'm glad that I could retroactively make uh, make Nikishi a better writer by me just being me coping. I'm not <laughs> saying that's what you're doing, does, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, but but because I really I do like I really like EPA and I think EPA has a lot of interesting things to say and I'm super excited when we get to EPA that we could talk a lot about what we liked and disliked about it. But I just incredibly think it's funny that we will just you know go on and you know you know defend Nukishi for his horrendous crime of <laughs> if you know. I mean, I'm not doing it. No, I mean, I will. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. I think my biggest problem with it is that like, let's say you are making a Shkanon theory and you're really heavy on your Shkanon theory and then you get to this scene and you see Kanon and Shannon on the same room and you're basically at the answer but it, it, this is such a strong scene that it just makes you give up on your theory even though you would be correct. That's actually not true. Most I, I can tell you that's not true. Most people who have Shkanon theory do not get deterred from this scene. How? <laughs> I, How? It's, you know... Go ask to go ask the two curious play people then. Go uh, go ask Vivian SK. No, I think that's just that one. I if okay, this is me who has never watched someone let's play Yeah, exactly. But yes. Go watch if, I, if I am to guess, I think that's just that one fallacy where you just disregard <laughs> clues that do not work with your theory, so you just forget about them. Because it takes a very big toll on your reasoning to try to figure out how the fuck these two people could be in the same room even though the detective is there. Like, how are you going to figure out this story is being told by a different POV? Even re-readers struggle to understand this scene. How would the first-time reader understand it? There's a lot of... I feel like there's there's more scenes that I struggle on a reread than I had a better time reading the first time. For yeah. example, it, I, for example, the the the, the EP three uh, tw- first Twilight murder will so forever haunt me to being the most <laughs> illogical murder of all time. <laughs> where, Wait, the first Twilight? Uh, the of uh, EP three. Oh, e- EP three. E- okay, EP three, yes. where uh, Nuikishi failed to mention that there's two doors in the fucking boiler room. It just said <laughs> boiler room is locked, and I was like, "There's a door that you can't lock in the boiler room. Why would you say?" He that? did mention it 40 hours ago yeah <laughs> like an ep1 didn't kind of get stabbed by someone from that other door yes yes 40 yeah. hours ago how, <laughs> how did you not remember that <laughs> so Simon, you I just, hard I just to try to solve. You told it to me. I just figured it out like ten seconds ago. What do you mean? <laughs> I just remember it honestly. Yeah, and it's really funny because uh, I just want you to know, uh, Sayome, We learned about this. Not even like Des and I. Like we made a whole episode about. Yeah, it. I know. <laughs> and then and then we were like sitting at a guest episode doing with like the two Chris play people. Vivian no, Husky. no, it was on. It, no, 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 no. That was a reaction of the argument because we actually realized it during the episode when Lorenzo was like, uh, yeah. I think the boiler room has two doors. And then we were like, like no uh, way, it's fine, uh, don't worry about it. Like, we, we also, because Lorenzo didn't find the exact text, so we were like, ah, whatever, let's just ignore it, let's not think about it. And then later <laughs> on, it was mentioning it, and then we were just like, there's two doors. And, I, and we were like, okay. And then Des just went silent. And Des just went and oh. searched for it. And his, oh De- Des was like, this is the last thing I'm going to post in this chat. And it's just a <laughs> screenshot of us saying, there's two doors in the boiler room and one of them don't lock. <laughs> God. Like, like, ah. Literally want to kill. Fuck Uminako. Fuck Uminako. That game. So I just wanted to tell you that there are actually clues in EP5. It's just that because we haven't read that far, we don't know. So we concluded there weren't tr- uh, clues. The only clue was in manga EP8. Because at the end of EP5, uh, Butler is fighting Erika and the way he wins is by making a Butler accomplice theory. So even a first time reader would know Butler is an accomplice. No, it's a Butler culprit Or culprit. Theory. So even yeah. a first time reader would know Butler's POV cannot be trusted and retroactively figure out that scene cannot be trusted. Yeah, okay, still it's bullshit. <laughs> Why do you think it's bullshit? <laughs> we get no fucking... Co- I don't understand it, even after all of this. Kind of just strolls in there and like... The fucking it said that like uh, Erica is like off of Shannon doing some gay shit. I don't know, and then like yeah, but but you ha- but at the end of EP five, Butler literally tells you he is the culprit, so you cannot trust his POV. I know, but the, he's not even in the room yet. 
Like, yeah, we can't go to the first, but like, shut up behind her. We just see, like, kind of in the fucking room. Like, what am I supposed to think? Maybe she doesn't see, maybe she doesn't see Canon. You're supposed to think that, that you're not seeing Erika's POV. The, the only time you know what Erika is seeing is when she tells you, the, like, see, when, when. I see with my eyelid eyes. <laughs> No, this is, so this is funny because this is a mystery where d- you're not seeing the detective's POV. It's like it's so different from any other mystery. Then it's not a mystery. Fuck you. It is a mystery because Erika tells you things. But what does she tell me? <laughs> she tells you like when when murders happen, she tells you, oh, she tells you... this door was not open, for example. And she has a detective's authority, so you know that the door was not open. But you never get to see her POV, only the things she tells you. Shut up. She... Okay, that was mean, I'm sorry. I think it's a funny trick. You're, you're about to think it's cheap. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you there are hints. It's not as... I think you're just a real Kishi stan and you don't see flaws. No, I, I, I do think it's a bad trick, but I don't think it's cheap. That makes sense. I mean, I do. I, I the, there's things that I have a lot of problem with. So there's like specific truth that I just find it really funny because, like, for example, the whole conceptual idea of like how EP three's truth work is like, what? How could you say like Canon is dead and Shannon is dead, and then there's nobody alive because even if Sayo is alive, Sayo is dead. Like that's just the funniest way to do that trick. Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. It's okay, so, but at that point, it's literally just actual bullshit. Like, not like here. It's like trying to not be actual bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your so your your gripe with it is that Ryukishi doesn't admit this is a bullshit trick. Yeah, is, is that your <laughs> okay? <laughs> no, your no, problem no. is that Ryukishi thinks he was a genius with this. Yeah, trick. yeah. <laughs> 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 like, do you think you need to personally come, come and apologize to Sayomi in person just to, yeah. to, you know, to confess his crimes? That's how I feel about the. Uh, the that's how I feel about the, the e. That, that fucking chain room trick. I'm just like, Luki, she needs to personally come and apologize to me. Like, I am personally offended <laughs> by this. Then, um, yeah. Wow, fuck Luki, she. True. So true, bestie. Right. <laughs> I, I, what, when is he ever gonna uh, give us a uh, phase two? Are ever. you gonna bring this up every episode? Now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. I agree. <laughs> I think about Welcome it. Welcome to the phase two begging podcast, where <laughs> where we beg for phase two. You haven't even read phase one. <laughs> I haven't. I, I don't read. Period. Phase. What are we talking about? <laughs> 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 Lorenzo's the smartest person out of all of us, you know. If if he has yeah. never read phase one, how could he be longing for phase two? Exactly. Maybe I just shouldn't read at all. <laughs> True. Maybe you should start by phase two, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'll start on phase two whenever that comes out. <laughs> okay. Um, is there anything else we want to talk about? Y- yes, I have so many things to talk about, Please. Mushroom. Do you, it, it, you're you're talking as if you haven't done like 20 something episodes of this with me i always have more thoughts <laughs> okay yes please go <laughs> okay okay small thought weirdo correlation between butler and kinzo kinzo in the cp mentioned that what makes you worthy of being the head is proclaiming you will get what you want and then actually committing and actually doing it and also in this segment butler says he will understand battle and then he actually does a funny little correlation to add to the... Does he, though? Hmm? Nothing. I'm, I'm just being a bitch. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, it's just a, a little correlation to add to the absurd amount of correlations between Butler and Kinzo, which I don't like. Ryukishi, why did you make correlations between the two of them? That's not good. But they're like the same character. What are you talking about? Yeah, why? What, what, what was the need for that? I, I don't like yeah. the fact that Butler is so intimately tied to Kinzo. I it mean, makes me but... feel weird. I mean, it's not. It's it is weird and not weird at the same time. I mean, EP six is all about how Kingzo is like Battler and how Battler wrote EP six to be like not to yeah. follow. Yeah. But the point is, but I like, but I don't like how how Ryukishi makes a correlation between Kingzo grooming and Butler grooming. Well, that chick well, battle. No, no, that's no, not good. No, no, no. Shut, shut that's, up. Shut up. That's yeah. not the point. No, no. But the point about that is not about well. The the point is that 
Battler wrote EP6 as like a gift to Beatrice in a way to break the cycle of, you know, grooming or not grooming, sorry, break the cycle of abuse in a way of like him actually acknowledging her. Of course, how weird it is to have the person you acknowledge who you also consider as your like a girlfriend's daughter but also her your your girlfriend to also be the same allegory as your grandfather's trying to have <laughs> sex with his daughter d- d- with all which at, you know it's, end, that, did that he, doesn't... <laughs> didn't Papa at the end she just marry her though like yeah yeah, yeah it's it, 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 the thing is that it's literally a one to one correlation Beato died <laughs> yeah. so Butler wants to revive Be- Beato so I, what does he do a, he takes a... chic Beato and turns her into Beato no that's yeah. not true though but, 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 but the one to one correlation doesn't work there because one is magic in a way like that yeah okay, but what does it symbolize like <laughs> didn't like Meta Butler write this like was he just high or something why did he <laughs> write like, this <laughs> <laughs> but like okay, but like okay. So to to come to a realization, okay, I'm not here defending incest. That's not what I'm trying to fucking. Do. Why? Yeah, that's just here for that. Why, Why are you against incest? <laughs> Why is incest bad? No, no. <laughs> Let me continue this. Let me continue. But what I'm trying to say is, I think. From the perspective of Balor, Balor wants to acknowledge Beatrice, especially like, you know, Beatrice Sayo, but also acknowledge Beatrice the second, who probably did have love for her father in a way that a normal person would have love for, oh, not a normal person, a person that person would have love for their father figure, but also had love for him maybe romantically. Those are two what? very individual. Okay, this is what I'm going, I'm going to sell you on this, despite the fact that I'm not even sure if I fully agree with it. So the thing is, it's like, do I, like, like, do I think it is justified nor even real? Like, of course, like, you know, Beatrice II went through years of abuse, and that's exactly why Beatrice II turns out to be the the way Beatrice II is. But like, in a perfect universe, you know, in a perfect universe, like, you know, Kingsville didn't abuse her. And, like, you know, they lived happily and they, she was acknowledged as the person she is, but also got to grow up and grew into her own person and is basically what EP6 is about. Like, you know. And then Kinzo marries her? I guess so. Like, that's where the, like, I mean, I mean, I don't, like, the thing is, is, like, that's what I mean by, I, like, it's it's not even, like, a perfect, okay, it's not. It's not like the perfect symbolism or anything. Like I think, like mushroom, you're you're trying to co- you're coping actually so fucking hard not yeah. to admit <laughs> that up. Butler is literally retracing in those steps but in like, EP6 without like realizing he, it. But no, no, no. Okay, actually, that's really wrong, Des. That's not something I will I will destroy you on. Oh, okay. I don't think I don't think uh, I don't think Butler is retracing Kinzo's step without knowing it. I think he is doing it deliberately. That's so he can fuck his daughter. So he can fuck his daughter. No, no, no. I'm going to explain this. I'm going to explain it. I think, like, to 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 basically to construct EP six in general is to basically, you know, like, you know, to be able to be a game master in the first place is to intimately understand like the structure of the story of Umineko and the structure of everybody's past and forth and so on and so forth to be able to be, even become the game master in the first place. Also, to you know, know Sayo's heart. And then for, with all of that means that Balor definitely knows, like, the thing about, like, Beatrice II and Kingzo. Like, this is gonna be me more coping now, so you could all laugh at me. But, like, it's the same, it's the same way how EP3, Beatrice plays, like, the character of, a, uh, like, a, of a character who, like, you know, gets sad when Balor berates her or gets mad when, like, when Balor doesn't listen to her. Like Battler's playing the role, like of like Kings or would like trying to explain a story, just like how like Beatrice wrote the character of Beatrice, like of like Eva Beatrice uh-huh. or something, like you know, like. Mm. And I, I mean, like this is me hard coping, <laughs> but like I genuinely. Okay, let me see if I understand. Are you saying that Butler? retraced Kinzo's steps so that Beato would grow up to be the Beato he knows so that she would have the same experiences? Yes, kind of. Oh, why Which, would he wait, do wait, that? But, That's so messed up! But, 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 but also, but also, but like, okay, but like, there's a few things I want to mention about that. Like, 
that's why also why I'm in the firm camp of believing Battler was the one who set up the close, like set up the logic error for himself. That's why also I why. Mean, yeah. Like, like that's a very obvious like. You know? Was so he realized he did something bad, so he put himself in the shame corner. No, no, he did like, it to revive Beatrice. He did it for, to revive Beatrice. Ah, uh, which is ah, uh, but still, ah, uh, uh, man, EP six gonna be such a headache. I I yeah. re- sorry, I really like the EP- I like EP six. Sorry, I'm, Me too. I'm sorry, but not sorry. It's it's my favorite EP. So, um, um, I mean, yeah, it's fucked up. I don't know. It's, it really depends on how you interpret it. But I mean, like you know, uh, depends on how you see the abuse. Well, I mean, yeah, Kingzo's a piece of shit. Like, I'm not here to, like, talk about Kingzo, but... I yeah. mean, at the end of the day, they're all Christians, so a little bit grooming, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sayomi. Well... Okay, well, no. speak- sorry. Let me finish my coping corner so Des could continue with whatever the fuck he's okay, thinking about. Okay, yes. Do, do, do your stuff. Get it out of your system. I have nothing else. That's it. Please continue. Oh. Okay, so speaking of Atwer, how the fuck does Butler know of the man from 19 years ago? Uh, Sayo told him, because he's Sayo. in on it already. From the beginning, he's in on it. Oh, so like, Butler... Yeah, is... because he already sees them in the power, of course he's in on it. No, I know Butler has to be... Ah, that's true, I'm so fucking... How the fuck <laughs> did I think Butler was an accomplice slash culprit without knowing about Sh- Shannon and Ka- I'm so fucking dumb, of- yeah. <laughs> Also, it was said that I think the first phone call was actually Sayo or something. Uh, I don't know. No, oh no, the second phone call. I had think. to be Butler because of the voice acting. Well, the no, voice no, acting. The, the voice acting doesn't matter. The voice acting doesn't matter. Do it, I think it was very no, deliberate no, to no, use no. Butler's voice. In the second phone call, like it's literally Butler's voice, but like you, there's like a red truth that says Butler did not call. Yeah, or I something. think that's an EPA. Yeah, because that's the man yeah. from 19 years ago, metaphorically. Shut the fuck up. No, I... I <laughs> the red truth is semantics. Your mom is semantics. <laughs> what does even anything matter anymore if the red truth is semantics? Like, from a certain point mm. of view, I am dead inside. I, uh-huh. I do. I, 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 okay, I, I, I do think the phone call was made by Simon. I, I do believe that. Like, I 100% believe that, like, Simon made the phone call. I don't know right now, but one of them was made by Sai and one of them was made by Butler, I think. Oh, that's also very, yes. They could have just used a voice changer, I don't fucking know. A voice changer that works so perfectly, goddamn, where are they getting those at? Well, clearly voice changes work on this fucking island if, you know, like, you know, lots of people don't realize that Shannon and Cannon are the same person, so clearly everybody's fucking yeah. deaf and blind at the same time. Well, no, she could just, Sai could just be very good at making that voice, but like to actually impersonate Butler so well... Okay, but like, uh, how would they get paid? Like, hmm? how would they get paid? Like, wouldn't they realize that it was like that she was getting like the salary of two different people because it was like the same bank account or something? They don't because the people who probably distribute the money is like Kingzo, not Kingzo, uh, Genji or something. Uh, G- Genji, oh. yeah. I guess. Okay, but I have a question. If mm, did Sayo was Sayo just like, hey, I'm gonna buy you three this time, and then just bought Butler, Kirie, and um, Rudolf. Was that it then? She bought. She bought off everyone. Everyone is this CP four again? Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Basically, everyone except Natsuhi and the uh, Erika. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Why? That's so funny. Just, just because to fuck with air. Er- f- also, it's later implied that, like, do you remember the fucking Goda attack scene? It, it said that he's he just fucking attacked himself or something. It's yeah. very fucking funny. I mean, ah, I, mean, I see what one day's do. Okay, it's just ah, funny, stupid mystery. It, it works, so you can tell it's a bad mystery. Well, it's. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it you know it doesn't really have love because it's not a story to prove to battle or anything. It's just a pure revenge fantasy yeah, to, to yeah, Nazi. Makes sense. It's so it's all about terrorizing Nazi. That's that's really good. That's really good because the that's kind of like it. It is weird. Like why would we leave Nazi out of it? But that just shows you the sh- the trick was made before the story around the trick. It's it just the, the story was made to fit in with the trick. It is kind of poorly written. So hey, Sayome, here's a canonical a canonical explanation for the cheap trick at the start. Yo, Yukishi's such a good Yukishi's such a good way that he wrote a bad story on purpose. Wow. <laughs> oh no! Did I just make a go <laughs> argument? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I think I think I think story good. Maybe Ki, maybe Kishi is good. Christ. Okay, but it makes sense here. Okay, this is not this is not as shallow as go. Okay. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. It's fine. Just tell me. We're gonna cry about it later. Yeah. We need to to invite Ryukishi in for a guest. No, episode. I'm gonna scream at him too much. He's gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna cry at this way. <laughs> I'm just doing Kishi. Why did you do that to me? <laughs> I'm not gonna understand Japanese. Uh, we're gonna bring a non in. If you had one question to ask Ryukishi, what would you ask him? Like honestly, why are you so fucking stupid? Why did you? Would you? Wh- why did you write go? Like, did, is it out of a misguidedness of believing you're gonna make f- like fate zero money, like fate money? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. There's so many questions. Wh- where is where is phase two? <laughs> so true okay Daz please keep continue please tell me please tell us more okay I found it very funny when Nazi he was like ah yes we need people to lie with us I guess we can get Shannon Canon Kumaso is good at lying she's always lying about being sick we can get her in hmm Nanja's probably gonna be hard to, to, to make him lie and, it's, and as a rereader you read this and you're like you have no idea Natsuki <laughs> Yeah. It was also just kind of interesting to see kind of like saying like uh, Shannon shouldn't be there at the day of the family conference. I don't know what it could mean. It could, it could kind of be that maybe like she doesn't want to go through with it, all that shit, but I don't know. Who are we talking about? Uh, basically, like earlier when Genji was talking to like uh, Shannon and Kanon, uh, Kanon is like, Nissan, why don't you take the day off or something? Like, because ah. he's, he's worried that she will screw up and stuff and I don't know, it could be like a metaphor for her not wanting to actually do it or something. Yeah, that's actually a really... Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Could be. Um, okay, sorry. I feel like we didn't actually talk a lot about the scenes that are happening right in front of us. So what do we want to talk about Erica OC do not steal? Like She has an OC design. <laughs> I have a lot of things that I want to discuss regarding Erica, but I don't know if this, these are the chapters that I want to discuss it in. Okay. What's the TLDR of your your talking points? I'm just gonna wait until we cover those chapters. It's easier. <laughs> I, I... She doesn't really say much yet. I think she just said, "I'm Erica. I'm funny." Yeah, uh, I do have to say, uh, a long time ago, Des and I argued about this, and I was like, "It's clearly to me that Erica is just a grown up version of Angie's child self." And Des was like, "What do you mean?" And I was like, "It's all in the design." <laughs> It's her hair. It's very and in the though. character too, because as you, as we can derive from the tree ending, Erica is who Angie would become if she did not go on this journey and find out. Hey, maybe knowing the truth isn't so good. Yeah, Erica is great. Um, did did ever, did did all of you hate her when she first showed up, or? Did, or did you like like and only enjoyed her on your reread or did you like immediately hopped on the Erica train? I mean, at first she was just like a normal person, like not normal, but like she was like uh, you know over the top, like oh I'm so cool, I'm so amazing, and mm-hmm. then she just went ape shit and it was it was based. <laughs> I don't remember how it if I liked her though. I think I did, but it, yeah. Funny. I was waiting eagerly for her because the reason I got into Mineko was the Eric Furuto Eric epic drawing video. So I was like, oh, why? Yes, Erika. <laughs> and then I start reading and she's just shitting on everyone, shitting on Jessica, shitting on... And I'm like, what the fuck? She's a villain? You got welcomed into this household. They fed you, they gave you clothes and you're treating them like this? Uh, I was very surprised. Then she just kills them. What a base girl was. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you know erica kills rich people that makes her the most base of all yeah <laughs> she just drifts on an island uh, gets picked up by the people there they play a prank on her and in retaliation she kills them what a base <laughs> girl boss and you know from this from this erica character's like personality right off the bat she's like gonna as we said before shapiro her way up the ladder <laughs> i don't know like expose everything she's basically like um what is it? She's almost like a, a what's it called? Shapiro? Like a walking tabloid, you know, like a tabloid journalist. <laughs> yeah, she's like a debate lord. She's a she's a total debate lord. Uh, I one of the things I really like about her is because she also um, embodies the concept of the cat box in the sense that 
she's a character that was just introduced in a setting that supposedly did not have any more characters. But because in the end everybody dies and there's no evidence, you can just invent a character and put them in there. And it works, because <laughs> yeah. the end result is the same. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the start of the absolute ridiculousness of what the answer arcs have to show you. And that that's all my thoughts. Really? Um, yes. Uh, uh, watch, yeah, you know, welcome back, everybody. Watch all of us cope hard about our thoughts about Uikishi. Um I still think he's great. <laughs> I'm so excited for EV7. <laughs> Christ. Uh... <laughs> I guess we could have done a full episode after all. Well, no, it's okay. I kind of like the this the nature of this. It's short, snappy, lots of room for more conversations and thoughts. So, uh-huh. with that, any more thoughts people need to share? Or uh, that was a bit of a gay Lam Dan Burn scene that was based. Happy Pride. Happy Pride. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that every every scene they are on? Yeah. <laughs> Slay, serve, and tea. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for tuning in with us. Yeah. Uh, see mm-hmm. cats, do crimes, catch you later. Slay. Slay. Mm-hmm. See ya. Whip bye bye. Slay. Slay. <laughs> bye. Hit the slay button, everybody. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Bye. <laughs>